Okay, so I'm Michael Sullivan, I'm with the International Radiologist at CAD, and I run the International Oncology Program, uh, which is basically image guided minimally, minimally invasive therapies for cancer. Um, we kind of live in the International Radiology Clinic, so as you've heard, we have this, this group of people that work for patients into us, and patients come directly to us, and then get assessed, and then we sort of integrate our care uh, in the program with the patient when that's uh, appropriate. So, uh, interventional oncology services, there are many. We uh, treat cancer uh, directly. Uh, basically, solid tumors almost anywhere in the body, so liver, kidney, lung, bone, uh, lymph nodes, any place that we can see and get to when the CAT scanner offers down guidance with any device. Um, and we do a number of therapies, which I'm going to go over briefly today. One is uh, ablation, and then some catheter uh, based therapies, uh, such as embolization and radiotherapy, which is local proliferative radiation. Uh, we do many other services for patients with cancer, a number of palliative care procedures, including drainage and standing of obstructed body parts, uh, providing uh, access for feeding and test for chemotherapy, um, and pain control uh, for people who need regional under blocks. And then we also manage a number of complications with cancer. So we're talking about neuroendocrine type tumors. Uh, I'm primarily treating patients with disease with metastatic the liver, but also metastasis to bones and lymph nodes. Uh, for the liver, we're really sort of following the middle path here, the middle road. So we'll get patients who have liver dominant disease, it's not disseminated everywhere, uh, who have either symptoms despite being on some sort of medical therapy, or the liver meds are affecting their liver function, or their tumor burden is just getting heavy and we're worried about the liver function. And then we look at them and say, well, can they just go to surgery, or if not, do they need to come to me? Excuse me. Um, so sorry. Sorry. You just use the on. Okay. I talk pretty loudly anyway. Ooh. Okay, so I'm going to start with tumor ablation. Tumor ablation is a technology that has not evolved very much in the last 500 years. So if you're fortunate enough to go to Tuscany in Italy and go to the lovely hillside town of San Gimignano, off the central piazza is the Museum of Torture. Of course, they don't call it that. Um, and we had a lovely visit there. My uh, wife and my son lasted about five minutes, and my daughter and I had a great time. And one, one of the devices in there is called the iron spider. And the iron spider was plunged into hot coals until it was glowing hot. And then you thrust it into the body, you grabbed the tumor, and you cauterized on the way out. Um, and if you look at the iron spider, it looks very much like a radiofrequency ablation probe. So really, the only change in the last 500 years is that we stick it in you first. Then we heat it up. And otherwise, it hasn't changed very much. So what are we trying to do when we ablate a tumor? Basically, we look for it, so we have to be able to see it under ultrasound or CAT scan, and then we have to be able to get there safely with nothing bad in the way. Uh, so here's an ultrasound image, and this is the probe coming into a liver, and then this big white cloud here is actually all the steam, the gas we're generating as we cook the tumor. Uh, this is a CAT scan image, so same idea. We've given you local anesthetic. We've steered a catheter in through the flank in between the ribs here and into this lesion in the liver, and now the tines are deployed, and we're getting ready to, to cook the tumor. So it's, it's like a biopsy. You come in, we image you, give you some local anesthetic, we put a probe in, then we give you lots of sedation to fall asleep for the cooking part, and then we take the probe out and put on a Band-Aid and you go home. So it's a very efficient outpatient procedure, and it's very effective for small tumors. So one of the important things to understand is, uh, and because people often ask about this procedure, uh, is that it's a very effective treatment for little lesions. So what we're trying to do is to cook the tumor and a margin of liver or kidney or whatever part of the body we're in around it to make sure we actually got the whole thing. Just as a surgeon who was doing a resection would try to cut out a margin of tissue around the tumor to make sure they got the whole thing. Um, and this works pretty well up to about two and a half, three centimeters. So I promise this is the only graph I'm showing you, but this is local control rate for tumors based on size. So the top line is tumors that were two and a half centimeters or less, so an inch or smaller in size. And you can see that it's pretty darn good. Out to a year, 80 plus percent can, can complete control of those tumors with no recurrence. But as the tumors get bigger, these are the, are the tumors that are between two and a half and four centimeters in size. And you can see by a year, about half of them have recurred locally. And bigger than four centimeters, it really doesn't work very well at all. So this is an effective therapy for inch or smaller lesions. But if you have bigger tumors than that, we're generally not going to try to ablate them. And if you have 20 tumors, trying to ablate them all is kind of silly. So we use this technique in people who have a few small lesions. Uh, and as I said, it's not just the liver. We've done it for bone metastases, lymph node metastases, lung metastases, as long as it's small enough and we can get there. So what do we do for patients who have large or multifocal lesions? And we're going to kind of focus on the liver here. So we want to treat them through the hepatic artery. And the liver is sort of unique in that its blood supply comes from two places. So you have this giant vein called the portal vein, which is a vein about the size of a hot dog that drains the blood from your whole GI tract, your stomach, your pancreas, your spleen, to the liver. 
And it nourishes about three quarters of the normal liver, but gives almost no blood to tumors in the liver. And then you have this little artery called the hepatic artery, which gives about a quarter of the blood to the normal liver and 100% of the blood almost to the tumors. So people figured that out about half a century ago and said, gee, maybe we can just give our chemotherapy directly through the artery. And they started doing that in the 1960s. So you run a catheter out here, and you infuse your catheter directly in the artery feeding the, tu the tumor. Um, and so you, the, the tumor gets a big whopping dose, and the liver and the rest of the body is relatively spared. And in fact, that works pretty well. So the other thing you can do besides infusing drugs through that artery is you can embolize it. You can occlude it and cut off all the blood flow. Or you can combine the two, and then you're doing chemoembolization, which is a procedure that was developed uh, about 30 years ago in Japan for treating primary liver cancer. But now we do it really worldwide for primary and metastatic disease to the liver, and we probably do two or three of these every day at HUP. Uh, so it does multiple things. You're embolizing, you're cutting off the blood flow to the tumors. That causes tumor ischemia. You're starving the tumor of oxygen and, and sugar it needs to survive, so the tumor dies. You're also delivering drugs at 20 to 200 times the concentration you could get if you got that drug IV. And because you cut off the blood flow at the same time, the drug gets stuck in there for weeks. So the tumor sees a lot of drug for a long time while it's dying from lack of oxygen and sugar. And because the drug doesn't leach out to the bloodstream too much, um, you get much less systemic side effects from the drugs. Uh, who can't we do it in? Well, people, you do have to have adequate liver function. So if you have really bad underlying liver disease, you may not be able to tolerate that. That's very unusual in patients with metastases. Uh, you do have to have flow through your portal vein because we're counting on the portal vein blood flow to keep your liver alive. So we look for that. Um, and if you have problems with your bile ducts, that can be an issue because the bile ducts, just like the tumors, they get their blood from the hepatic artery. So normally bile ducts are tiny, you can't even see them on a CAT scan, uh, and they can tolerate this. But if you have obstructed bile ducts, we see dilated bile ducts on your CAT scan, uh, you're likely to necrose those bile ducts along with the tumors, and you can get lakes of bile in the liver and get infected, it can be a mess. Even worse, if you've had prior instrumentation of your bile duct, so if you had a stent placed endoscopically, or you had surgery where they cut the bile duct and sewed it back to the bowel, now the bacteria that live in your gut also live in your bile ducts. And if you embolize the bile ducts or embolize the hepatic artery, um, you're gonna get a liver abscess. So that's a big problem. Pre-treatment evaluation of patients who are evaluating for liver-directed therapies, we need really good pictures of the liver. Right? So if you've had you know, an MIBG scan or a TRIA scan or something, you know, a nuclear scan, that is not a good picture of your liver. Okay? If you've had a conventional CAT scan where they give you an injection of contrast and got one set of pictures, that is not a good study. I need triple phase scans. That means they scanned your liver before the dye, and then after they inject you with the, with the contrast, they scan your liver three more times when the dye is in the artery, when the dye is in the vein, and then when the dye is out in the liver. And that gives you the best depiction of the tumor burden, but also tells me about the portal vein, the arteries, the bile ducts, everything I need to know. We scan your chest and the rest of the body where appropriate to make sure you don't have widespread metastases. We get blood work to make sure your liver function's okay. And then we all sit in the office and talk about what the options are. So the pretreatment imaging is really critical for me. I have to know where the tumors are and where the tumors are not, okay? So if a surgeon was gonna operate on you, he has to follow the rules of the plumbing of the liver. The liver has two lobes, it has eight segments, and you need to kind of cut between the segments and leave, you know, take out parts of the liver intact and leave other parts of the liver intact with their artery and their vein and their bile duct. I have to do the same thing. My treatment's based on the plumbing of your liver. If I catheterize the artery, the right lobe of your liver, I'm treating all the tumors in the right lobe of your liver. I'm not treating a specific tumor. So I need to know what segments and lobes have tumor and what segments don't, so I don't treat parts of your liver that don't have cancer. I also need to know the blood supply to your liver. So some people have simple blood supply to the liver. They have one main artery of the liver that has one left lobe branch and one right lobe branch, but only half of people are simple, and the other half have more complicated plumbing. So you can have arteries from your stomach to your liver, your intestines to your liver, extra arteries. Um, so I need to sort that all out, and I can tell that from a really good scan even before I get started. And then, of course, I have to know your portal veins open, your bile ducts are not blocked. So then what happens? Well, you come in and we run a little catheter up. You land a big x-ray table and we run a little catheter up under local anesthesia from your leg up to your liver. So if you ever had a heart catheterization, we just don't go quite as far and we turn right. So here's the catheter coming up from your leg and we hook the celiac artery, which is the first main branch of the, of the aorta in your abdomen. And that gives off a big artery to your spleen. So that's the artery of the spleen. A big artery to your stomach. And this patient has the most common variant, which has the artery of the stomach, gives off a big artery of the left lobe of the liver. So this is probably half or more of the left lobe of the liver coming off the artery of the stomach. And this is the usual main artery to the liver, which gives off another branch of the stomach, a branch to the pancreas. This is the rest of the left lobe, and that's the right lobe. All right, so I look at this picture, 
I say, okay, I want to treat the right lobe in this patient. Notice I'm not seeing any tumors, right? I'm just seeing plumbing. So I need the CAT scan to tell me what the tumor is. So if I want to treat the right lobe, I'm going to steer this catheter under x-ray and get it out here past all these arteries to stomach and other things that you don't want to get ugly stuff into and park it out there somewhere. So we do that and then we inject dye again. And uh, you, you take my word for it, the tip of the catheter is right here where you see this little bit of spasm in the artery. So you know my fellow did it, not me. Um, and we've injected dye, and partly because of the spasm, it's refluxing backwards. So you're seeing stuff, but basically the tip of the catheter is here. So I'm treating everything from here out. So this is that right lobe, and notice we see another artery coming off here that we didn't see before. That's the artery of the gallbladder, okay? So knowing that, um, I would want to move this catheter out another couple centimeters and get just past the artery of the gallbladder, so it's just treating the liver but not embolizing the gallbladder. Um, when we're treating patients, once we get out there, we can embolize them a couple different ways. You can do bland embolization where you just plug up the artery, or you can do chemoembolization, as I discussed, where you mix the drugs in. Um, and for many kinds of cancers, there actually isn't much evidence that those are very different. But in neuroendocrine tumors, it turns out, you get better disease control, at least in our experience at Penn, with chemoembolization. So this top group is looking at freedom from progression. That is, how long did we control the tumor in the liver before it grew again? And in the bland embolization, people who did not get the chemo drugs mixed in, it was zero. So by a year, every single patient progressed, whereas half the patients had not progressed if they got chemo embolization. And in fact, at three years, a third of the patients had not progressed, had disease control in their liver after being chemo embolized. Survival also trended to be better in the chemo embolization group, although that is not certain. The other alternative is to do radioactive bead embolization. So this is the same principle that as we're treating through the artery of the liver, but instead of plugging it up with chemo embolization, instead we're instilling millions of tiny little radioactive beads. And the idea with these beads is they're so tiny, they don't clog up the arteries, they actually go through the arteries and get embedded in the tumor itself. And then these little microspheres are embedded with yttrium-90, which is a very potent radiation source, and they radiate your tumors internally. And this radiation is very heavy, it can't travel very far. It can only go a few millimeters from each bead. So basically, you're delivering a whopping dose of radioactive material inside, inside the tumor, and it can't get out of your body. So in fact, you're not radioactive on the outside. It's a little bit more complicated to do. So one of the things we have to do is measure the volume of liver that we're going to be treating. So with that, we do from your CAT scan. And we calculate the volumes of the right and left lobes, which helps, helps us to determine the dose we're going to give. And then, uh, when you come in, to, if, you're gonna, if we're going to go down this route, the first time we do our catheterization, you know, I map out your plumbing like I showed you uh, uh, in the previous pictures, uh, and then we get our catheter where we want to do our treatment, and we do a test injection of some mildly reactive albumin spheres. It's a simulation that mimics an actual treatment. And we want to see, did these things actually go to the tumors? And more importantly, make sure they didn't go to place bad. So we basically do this test injection, then we take the catheter out, and we roll it up to nuclear medicine, and you get a nuclear medicine scan. So these are a couple different patients, and we want to see if the stuff went into the lobe of the liver and didn't go anywhere else. So these black dots are just markers on the patient on the outside. Here is the right lobe of their liver, densely lighting up with the test injection we did, and there's nothing anywhere else, nothing in the chest, nothing in the stomach. Here's a patient, same idea, the right lobe of the liver was injected, so here's the whole right lobe of their liver lighting up, and notice that we see the lungs. All right, so that means probably 10% or more of the dose we injected in the liver went to the lung, it didn't get stuck in the liver, it filtered right through and ended up in the lungs. And most people, it's less than 5%. But if it starts getting more, that means we're now reading the lungs as well as the liver, and the lungs have a limited tolerance. So some people shot so much of the dose to the, liver, to the lung, we can't treat them at all, and right? we just have to do something else. Some people, you see sort of a little bit of extra shunting, we might drop the dose to the liver just to make sure we're safe. So we use all this information to determine we can treat you safely, and then you, know, you go home. We calculate the dose, we order the beads that are right for you, which come from either Australia or Canada, and then you come back a couple weeks later, we catheterize you all over again, and this time we inject the hot beads. And then we take the catheter out, and you have four hours of bed rest, and you go home. So this is a very mild, gentle treatment, has almost no side effects, and can be done, unlike chemobilization, it can be done as an outpatient, and you can basically go home. When you go home, then the beads are doing their thing, they're radiating you for the next few weeks, and we check out about a month later and make sure you recovered, and then we bring you back and order a dose for the other side and inject the other side. Um, so this is what it kind of looks like uh, when you come in. You're just lying on the table getting catheterized, but we have this fancy apparatus here that we have to set up to make sure we can instill these beads uh, safely without radiating us while we're radiating you. Okay, so the take home message, if you're making the decision between yttrium microspheres versus, say, chemobilization is, um, the radiation therapy is less toxic, it can be done as an outpatient, it does require an extra catheterization, uh, so one more procedure to plan it. It takes a longer time to respond, so chemobilization works immediately. I can get a scan the next month and I know what I killed. With the reactive beads, I have to wait three months before I can see a response on CT or MRI. So it takes longer to know if it worked. 
Uh, it's important to remember that it's not safer than chemo mobilization. It's less, less side effects, but the complication rate's about the same. And it's also not better in the sense that it works just as well for tumor control. So I think you can really go either way. Um, uh, and it's kind of up to the patient whether you're in a hurry or not. Uh, there are some intriguing things with the reactive spheres in that you can combine them with various forms of systemic therapy that enhance the effect of the radiation. So for instance, some patients with certain types of neurocon tumors are on um, capecitabine, uh, which is an oral chemotherapy agent uh, that uh, enhances the effect of radiation. And we start actually combining these treatments where I do the SIR spheres therapy while they're getting uh, this form of oral chemotherapy to see if we get a better result. So just to sum up, the majority of neurocon liver metastases can be controlled by embolization or ablation. Uh, one thing I didn't really focus on, but we can use this for downstaging. So if someone comes in, we can debulk them by embolizing their tumor first and potentially make them resectable. So some patients get treated this way first and then go on to have a liver resection. Um, and uh, even if they can't, we can get very good long-term long control of their disease uh, by embolotherapy. Embolotherapy can be repeated infinitely. I've treated patients, you know, 16 times over a dozen years. So, you know, you can get very, very protracted and prolonged control of metastatic disease using these techniques. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.